there's a master service provider's role in that. And you can uh, continue to answer what David was talking about, of course. Yeah, I yeah, know. I'm, I'm trying to cover six answers in, uh, yeah. in one go. But, uh, I'm not a very good facilitator, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. But, but uh, bear with me uh, for a second, because uh, I saw a few chats coming in also on our talent pools used. Uh, uh, what is the, has, has there been measured what a, a direct sourcing model versus agency, what's the value of the agencies? So let me let me uh, try to answer a few questions based on uh, my own experience. Uh, as to David, also we uh, started uh, creating a talent community, uh, starting with uh, with our freelancers in the Netherlands. At some point uh, three years ago, we we spent 50 million, five zero million on freelancers uh, at any given moment. Um, one third of our contingent population. Uh, and, and all through agencies and intermediaries. Uh, we kept on hiring them uh, typically for one to two plus years. So at some point, the value of those intermediaries uh, became well, very uh, limited. We also, and that's a, a use case of so, such a talent pool, we also wanted to be able to reconnect with those talents David mentioned with specific skills. So we built it within our talent pool, uh, different sections for specific skills. and. Uh, offer managers uh, an opportunity to work with them for four hours and then the next week for another uh, couple of hours uh, and reconnect. And, um, so that is that is definitely something where it's, it's really valuable and for talent it could also be attractive because they work well directly for us. Um, the, the other thing there is uh, I'm, 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 uh, I realize that I mentioned the freelancer a couple of times and it's not that uh, uh, that I'm, I'm uh, uh, talking about the future of work and uh, the, uh, that I believe that the workforce will be flexible and freelancing uh, for 50% uh, in two years from now. But um, uh, I think uh, because one of the things which is a risk of hiring a freelancer is, of course, local legislation. You, you really take, have to take that into account. So the SOW part, switching to your, your question, Bill, it's an interesting one in this example because we so far have actually contracted all those freelancers uh, on a more time and material basis and officially uh, if you're an independent contractor in the Netherlands or looking at IR35 or uh, uh, even uh, 1099s in the US you have you, you're actually not allowed to use them uh, uh, for false uh, uh, employment uh, uh, reasons and, and so on so what, what my take is here is that looking at this uh, this setup is that we actually need to contract freelancers um, uh, on an output basis, which which then uh, requires the ability of our managers and of our business to translate uh, uh, work into and what work needs to be done and what is the outcome we are requiring. And that is something which is uh, quite difficult. And that's where the role of the MSP is evolving. So where they did a simple sourcing to traditional agencies uh, traditionally, now you see more and more of them uh, being able or uh, building the capability of breaking it down into work pieces, packages, using the F uh, VMSs to structure that and pay per milestone and therefore be more compliant and so on. So let me stop there, but um, quite a few touch points. Super. Thanks very much indeed. Um, the next question that's come up, um, that came up in our first session, is how is technology being used in the hiring process, um, and what are the future trends? Now we're not talking about video interviews or something here. We're talking about platforms. Um, so the person to talk, the person to answer this one is is Manuel, isn't it? Um, how is technology being used in the hiring process in Total Talent? Thanks. And I think Martin just started to answer that question in the last sentence. He yeah. said, you know, where, where basically the technology gives you the total visibility. And what, what we see is the convergence of, of time and material and, and packaged, uh, you know, SOW-based uh, engagements, where uh, as a user, as an hiring manager, you need to know what's happening and you need to be able to decide what to do. So that's, that's part of my, my answer to that question. And the second, the second answer for me is that, and we touched that a bit with procurement versus HR, is contingent labor a, a, a procurement category, and do you need a procurement system to source and manage to, to, to 
buy stuff, or, or is that more a talent management platform which includes some procurement functionalities? And, and again, are we buying people in the same way we buy pencils? And what we are seeing ourselves, what we are seeing ourselves, is, is, is a clear focus on on talent, people, skills, profiles, you know, uh, that type of elements in the technology, uh, going more towards the HR and, and talent than that procurement. DMS vendor management system. Vendor management is for procurement, you know, that's a core function of procurement and management goals. So that's part of the evolution. Uh, the other element is um, an ecosystem of solutions. So an open ecosystem whereby uh, specialized niche uh, functionalities are brought in, and that can be things like um, uh, compliance, background check, uh, direct sourcing, which is open, you know, how do you plug uh, that platform into all those platforms that are providing you talent. Uh, and then if you, you, you look a bit more, you know, uh, forward, forward thinking, it's all about the AI and, and the machine learning, uh, where basically the idea is not to replace a human, is to supplement and help the human. So how do you do uh, profiling of people? How do you do uh, uh, better job descriptions? How do you do better matching between the offer and the demand? So this is all, all what we are working as a technology so in terms of algorithm, algorithms. I'm so going to um, you know, Everything around reporting, predictive analytics, workforce, workforce modeling, rate benchmarking. So those are the areas which we see evolving in our business. Super. Thanks very much. I'm going to uh, go back a little bit uh, to uh, Pauline's just reminded me. We had a question from the audience uh, on um, which agencies to choose. Um, Pauline, could you bring in uh, Roisin? Um, can you do that? Hopefully it's working. Are you, I'm mute. are you ready? Yeah, I've just upgraded. There you are. Yeah. <laughs> ready, ready. Hi, ready hi, hi Rashi. You had, a, you had a question about choosing about which agencies to choose for some specialist roles. I, I did, but to be honest with you, a lot of it has kind of been answered over the past hour. Right. I mean, there's still what's going on. But I guess my, my original question, if I want to broaden it out a little bit, was um, was related to specialist versus generalist recruitment and, and how we manage that. And I think if, if I think back on all of the, the topics that have been covered, I mean, the, the talent pools idea and the freelancers idea, um, I mean, yeah, the question I guess I wanted to kind of whittle it down to was when we're looking at the, these kind of traditional procurement KPIs, we have one that's obviously supplier management or supply base consolidation. And, you know, if we have, uh, you know, in our case, one European contract or a global contract with a large MSP, how do we kind of match that against the specialist requirements that some areas have, which would be in our case, procurement actually, we, we have a need in procurement. We are a kind of a specialist area. We do have specialist requirements for strategic procurement particularly. And um, yeah, it was kind of how to balance the, this kind of requirement for keeping this firebase consolidated while meeting those needs, whether it's Super. procurement or any other area. Thanks. We'll, we'll fire that one. Up. Fire that one. Up. Who would like to pick that one up? Vera, perhaps. Oh, David would like to pick it up. Thanks, yeah. Roshin. That's super. Uh, so, Roshin, I, I, I can readily identify with this uh, uh, pressure of reducing suppliers, and we have too many suppliers. We don't want to manage too many suppliers. So, I think you need to break in this area up into into little bite-sized bits. So, for example, for blue-collar workers, you probably have you know, in a country, one, maybe two suppliers, that's all, you don't need any more. Uh, and you can get uh, all you need uh, through them. However, if you're going to look at your IT resources or your specialized R&D resources, or even your procurement resources, uh, you probably won't get uh, the requisite talent from your generalists, so you're gonna have to have some specialists. So um, you don't wanna have too many, because what happens is they lose interest, that they, they'll stop putting in CVs and not getting business. You need enough, have a little bit of competition, but not too many where it's not interesting for the supplier because they're not getting business. So you need to find balance between um, having uh, lots and lots because you feel you get the best talent, but actually it's kind of productive. So um, 
that number will be different, but it's not a huge number. So in the end, you've got to break it down into the specialist areas and have a small group of suppliers in each of those areas. Thanks, David. Any other comments? And we'll come on to some of the pluses and minuses. In fact, let's let's do a poll um, on uh, the risks and benefits of total talent management. Um, and thanks, then we have a Thanks very much indeed, Roshi. That's super. Um, what is the main risk or downside of total talent? I'm going to launch that poll now, and then we can have a couple of questions around it. What is the main risk or downside of total talent? Lack of loyalty and commitment from external staff. Difficulty working with mixed internal and external teams. Complexity of systems for engaging different types of staff. And loss of intellectual property, knowledge, and know-how. Uh, so, as they're coming in there, what, um, Vera, what's your view on um, what you think will be the outcome there? Yeah, I would have um, expected other, or also additional answers. Um, what to do with, uh, with all these data, or what to do with the data you get, or the results you get. So, um, what does it tell me? Um, yeah, that, that, that's something, that's the downside. Yeah, who's the owner um, of the total talent management uh, tool yeah? uh, or program? Yeah, so um, who's taking ownership of all the results we get out of this? Um, right, I've stopped the polling. Thanks for it. Thanks for it. I'm going to share the results with you. Um, and there you are. The, um, the biggest fear is the loss of intellectual property, knowledge and know-how. Um, and amazingly, lack of loyalty and commitment from external staff is low. Does that come as a surprise to anyone? And to me it does, yeah. I find it surprising. I'm Vera, not sure. yeah? Sorry, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure it's surprised because, you know, we, I think we live in a world, I mean, maybe a generation thinks, you know, but if I see my 20 year old guy, he doesn't care about working at Philips or Novartis or whatever, what he wants is a sexy motivating, challenging project, you know, and his, his commitment and his dedication to the job will be based on what he gets, the reward he gets in terms of experience learning challenge. So that loyalty to a brand, I mean, I've got some gray hairs and probably from a little bit of another rhythm back in the time. And that, that's why I'm, I'm not surprised, you know. On, on the question, I would have seen, you know, compliance and finding the right balance between you know, what you retain internally, what you outsource, uh, you know, how, how, how do you make sure you, you reward your internal staff and you don't just give all the great projects to external guys. But for me, it would be the, the, the risk and the side of the mental yeah. Bill, um, I actually voted in the 4%, um, and the reason why is uh, I think corporations, big corporations in particular, they like to be able to control their staff. And if you're an employee, you are you have a relationship of dependence on them and they can hire and fire you at their at their at their guise. If you're a freelancer, particularly a highly skilled one, um, that changes that dynamic and um, uh, you know it becomes a, more of a um, you know I'll do this if it's interesting for me. Uh, it's an interesting project and it, the pay rate is okay. I'll do it. But tomorrow I'm off if I don't like you. You know I don't have to put up with politics and with BS in the organization, which employees do. So you lose that power, and there is a dynamic of power there in organizations that they like to have that and don't want to give it up. Um, that's one of, the, one of the things. To me, the other, you didn't have it here, but uh, I've seen it. You can create all of the tools uh, and put it all in place and do all the plumbing and the electricity to have total talent management, and nobody will use it because they stick with the old ways. So for me, the biggest risk is are we ready and able to make that cultural shift? Because that's what it is. It's a massive mind shift from the 20th century model into a new way of working, which is actually we blur the lines between temp and perm, and, and we're just going to focus on work and getting talent in, and not so much about whether you're a temp or not. Um, and that's where I think most organizations struggle and will struggle when they get to this. Did we miss one uh, question from Matt? Um, is it possible? Um, 